So if you've just tuned in, we'll be starting in just a few minutes. I always find it awkward at the start of these webinars when there's just silence and people are staring at the screen wondering when it will start, why, why the moderators don't do something to entertain people. I have a captive audience, I could sing, but I'm not going to do that. Is there a CCIH theme song maybe that we could play? That's a great idea, we could commission that. You can type into the uh, chat boxes where you're joining from if you want. Let us know where you are. Thanks for the encouragement, Paul. I'm not going to sing, but thanks. But please, if you uh, want to let know, let us know where you're joining from, put it into the chat. Great. Well, that's exciting. That's great. Very exciting to see everybody joining in, thanks. All right. Well, I think we're at a critical mass here. I think we can go ahead and get, uh, get started. Uh, thanks again for everybody who's uh, joined in with us. Uh, to our, uh, for our discussion today on CCH 30 by 30, uh, health systems are the backbone of healthy and resilient communities. Uh, so I'm Doug Fountain, I'm executive director of CCIH. Uh, we're an international network of approximately 150 Christian organizations and 15 secular partners, as well as uh, a few hundred individual members. Our mission is to promote health and wholeness from a Christian perspective and we provide opportunities for capacity building, networking, and sharing best practices and advocacy. We launched the 30 by 30 Health System Initiative in order to demonstrate the power of faith-based organizations to strengthen at least 30 health systems by 2030. That's where 30 by 30 comes from, 30 health systems by 2030. You see our current global situation this on the front of all of our minds makes it so obvious, so evident why we have to have a strong focus on health systems. But COVID is not the only strain on local health systems. Other disease outbreaks, as well as population displacements, conflict, famine, other emergencies, all of those undermine even the strongest health systems. Faith-based organizations and health providers are critical in the fabric of health services. They're regarded for their emphasis on quality, dignity, ethics, as well as a holistic focus that includes social, emotional, and spiritual health, as well as physical health. For that reason, we asked organizations to commit to specific ways they could strengthen local health systems. A new summary of those are available on the CCIH website. I hope that many of you have had a chance to see that, and after this call, I encourage you to open that up on the CCIH website. You'll find it under resources in the 30 by 30 page there. And you can link, open it up, and, and the commitments are truly inspiring and encouraging. Today, we're going to hear from three members who are doing important things as part of those. Josh Gunther of LifeNet International, Perry Jansen of Africa Mission Healthcare, and Nancy Tenbrook of World Renew. Josh is, is the Uganda Country Director at LifeNet International. Josh has worked in the region for seven years, first with a rural health facility in Burundi, before moving to Uganda to establish and expand LifeNet's country, Uganda Country program, among other things, and among other things, launching a holistic community-based non-communicable disease program. This is very exciting. Perry Jansen is vice president at Africa Mission Healthcare, where he leads health system strengthening work. AMH works to strengthen mission hospitals toward becoming teaching hospitals. Perry is also a family physician and spent 16 years in Malawi where he founded Partners in Hope, which is a local leader in HIV treatment. And then Nancy Tenbrook is a senior program consultant with World Renew. 
Nancy served in Bangladesh and India since 1987. Nancy focuses on rural community development and supports a variety of projects and partners in that work and engages local community groups and churches, helping with training and values formation. So that's the panel that we're uh, going to hear from today. Now, this is how the thing is going to flow. As far as the, as far as this, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Zoom technology, first, please feel free to type questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen at any point. If you go down and hover down there, you'll see uh, the Q&A box, not the chat, but the Q&A box. Uh, we won't be using the chat box for monitoring for questions. We'll also hold the questions until after all three speakers have had a chance to present. To ask a question, just click on that Q&A button, type in the space and hit send. If you want to ask question, if you want to ask a question anonymously, you can check that box. This webinar is being recorded. If you registered for the webinar, you'll receive a link to the recording or you can find it on the CCIH YouTube channel and the webinars playlist and on the CCIH website under resources in 30 by 30. So with that, I think we're going to serve up first, Josh. So uh, Josh in Uganda, please take it away. Okay, great. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening to everyone that has joined us. Um, I'm really, yeah, my name is Josh Gunther and I've been serving with Life International here in Uganda for the last five and a half years. Um, I'm really excited about this opportunity to speak with everyone. Um, and I wanna thank the CCIH team, Doug, and Kathy, Mona, and others for being such wonderful partners for LifeNet and also giving us an opportunity to make a public commitment towards the goals and objectives that we want to accomplish here in Uganda. So moving on to our, my next slide. Um, yeah, our journey to scale is something that's very, very exciting and a really wonderful part of our journey. Um, LifeNet International is a system strengthening and capacity building organization that seeks to transform African health centers to provide quality, sustainable care. Um, we were founded, as you can see, in 2012 in the heart of Central East Africa in Burundi. Uh, there, we started with our first 10 partner facilities delivering medical and managerial training programs that were designed to equip health workers to provide evidence-based care to their patients in a financially sustainable way. As you can see, we've achieved a lot of early success and we've expanded significantly over the years since our founding. Um, and for the past five years in Uganda, I have come from a single employee working out of a home office to managing a team of more than 35 staff. And we work on and train uh, 72 different partner facilities here in Uganda. Um, presently, we're planning to expand and add 20 more partners to our network this year. So you can see as of the start of 2020, our entire network com compromises five countries of operation in Burundi, Uganda, Malawi, DRC. And we also do some work with a couple partners in Kenya. We have 220 health partners uh, across those five countries covering more than 4 million uh, catchment uh, population. And we've got more than 70 team members um, and that includes our, our US team as well, which is small but mighty. Um, a little bit more about our model on the next slide. What we do is we take evidence-based practices and managerial best practices and deliver them directly to health facilities across our countries of operation. We transform, yeah, again, we, we want to take these facilities and change them dramatically um, and a before and after so that they are pictures of what quality sustainable care looks like. Um, delivering our training curricula directly to healthcare workers in their work settings, we ensure ongoing adult learning takes place and we work with our partners to ensure implementation, um, overcoming barriers that they might face and walking alongside each partner in a very specialized way. We organize our training teams, as you can see, is a, a medical and a management curriculum are delivered by experts in those fields to groups of facilities that we call cohorts. And each training team takes on a mentorship and a supervisory role with each partner facility that they work with. Um, we believe that by turning traditional centralized training models up and down, we're able to maximize our impact and, and deliver true application and implementation of everything that we teach. 
And again, we believe that we're doing this in a way that is financially sustainable and it helps our partners to achieve financial sustainability. On the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about what we call the LifeNet way. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, we bring our expertise, our tools, our curriculum to each of our facilities, and we ask that they come alongside us as we work together to achieve common goals. The LifeNet way is not necessarily about dictating, about instructing. It's about coming alongside each of our partners. And we do this through shared values. And those values are dependence on God, you know, working with within faith-based health systems here in Uganda and all the countries that we operate, we come together with that same understanding and meaning of purpose of why we are here. Um, impact at scale, we believe that what we do is scalable as we've been able to demonstrate. And we know that what we're achieving now, it means that we're unlocking future potential for scale. Compassionate care is a critical component ensuring that involves you know, equity, access to equitable and quality health services, but again, services that are delivered in compassionate ways to the people that we work with. Database decision-making is something that we hold very true um, to the, the core of what we do. And we also work to help our partners achieve that same standard of, of excellence. And finally, we look to empower local church. Each of our facilities is tied to a diocese or a parish that um, is the lifeblood of that community, is the lifeblood of sometimes that facility itself. And we know that by strengthening health, system, health delivery out of these facilities, we're also strengthening and empowering the local church to make a greater impact in the communities that they serve. Um, on our next slide, we recently, um, you know, last year we, we launched LifeNet's new vision for expansion called 101010. And what 101010 stands for is 10 countries of operation, $10 million in annual revenue, and 10 million patient visits impacted annually. And our, our objective to do this is by the year 2023. Um, we want to be able to do this at the cost of $1 per patient visit improved. So for every patient that comes into a facility, they're experiencing a higher quality of care and uh, more significant and better health outcomes as a result of the care that they're receiving at these facilities. This is a very expansive and exciting and challenging vision, uh, but it's something that um, has really motivated myself as a country director. I can speak for all of the other directors as well. Um, this is something we've internalized and recognized that this is something that is possible for us to be able to achieve. And we're very, very excited, and I'll get more into the specifics of what our commitment means with the 30 by 30 initiative. Um, but we're excited to see that uh, other partners like CCIH are coming alongside to support us in this initiative, say, yes, we believe that you can do this too. So we're really, really excited by the ambition here. Uh, next slide. In terms of delivering health system strengthening um, and being able to we kind of refer back to the WHO system building blocks of health system strengthening. I wanted to make sure that we had um, some of these terms brought forward uh, as we go into further discussion. So as you can see on the left side of your screen, you have the WHO system building blocks. And on the right side of the screen is how LifeNet approaches each of those different blocks. Um, one of the things that we don't do at the bottom, you'll see is the leadership and governance aspect. Uh, again, one of the things that we kind of hold very sacred as an organization is ensuring that we are um, you know, working with and alongside the leadership, uh, the people that we work with, respecting their authority and their autonomy. So again, LifeNet isn't an organization that comes down to issue directives, but we're there to walk alongside of our partners. And another key aspect of leadership and governance, governance is that there are other organizations um, much larger and much more experienced and have been around for a lot longer than LifeNet has that deal uh, very heavily in that particular area. But in service delivery, the pillar of service delivery, we look at improving quality of care um, and primarily focusing on how nurses deliver healthcare services. We know that nurses are the backbone of health service delivery in countries like Uganda, where there's about you know, one physician for every you know, two, 300,000 people. Um, so we see that nurses are delivering the 
a significant amount of care and even sometimes advanced emergent care uh, because there are no doctors in many of the facilities that we work in. For the health workforce, we work to address gaps in knowledge. We understand that people are equipped and excited and ready to make a difference, but we want to be able to see them um, even further unlocked with that potential. Um, we look at monitoring quality improvements. We engage in pharmacy management and support. And on financing, we look at how to improve areas like revenue generation, improve stewardship and accountability. And that all comes through our managerial training program. Next slide, please. So we monitor all of this through a very, very rigorous program. Um, we have a quality scorecard that we've developed as a resource that allows us to um, tie together all of the various curricula and various lessons that we train on and understand how they're being implemented at the facility level. And so to quickly move some of the, through these areas, these are all before and after training, a LifeNet training that's been done here. Um, we see massive increases in the ability of staff trained on how to prevent infection and ensure sterile treatment, which is something that's a critical importance now with COVID-19. Um, we see incredible increases in the ability to treat postpartum hemorrhage that includes the diagnosis, treatment, and, um, and, yeah, and uh, post-delivery care for, for mothers and infants. We see CPR has done um, incredible We've made incredible strides in teaching uh, healthcare workers how to um, resuscitate babies after they've been born. And we're also looking on manage, monitoring improvements on the managerial side through improvements in how facilities track revenue and expenditures on a daily basis. Next slide. Um, all of this is done not only internally, but also externally. Um, we value independent um, evaluation very, very highly. And we've developed a number of connections um, through academia, through public health institutions like Duke, um, other NGOs and organizations um, that I've listed here. And the idea is to apply that level of access to our everyday practices so that we're truly relying on data to inform everything that we do from a program standpoint. You can see here on um, some of our sample results from, this is from a study that was um, prepared for us by Duke's Global Health Institute. You can see massive increases across the board in areas such as hand washing, improving sterile cord clamping for and improving care for newborns, and even improvements in documentation during deliveries. Um, this gives us a growing confidence so that we can begin highlighting not only the quality data that we're working on, but also health outcome data. And we recently shared in our 2019 annual report, we highlighted that we uh, saved 241 newborns during the year that were saved at birth after partners used resuscitation techniques that were taught by LifeNet staff. Um, so that's an exciting stage for us to get to where we start talking about health outcome data. All right. Uh, moving on to um, the kind of final couple of slides that I have here. Our CCIH commitment is really walking side by side to on the way to our 10-10-10 vision. And as looking at LifeNet um, Uganda, our country program's contribution to that vision, 10 million patient visits, 10 million in revenue, is uh, we have a deep desire and we believe that it's possible to achieve 60% um, penetration in the faith-based healthcare market here in Uganda. Um, that represents more than 350 facilities, most of which are serving rural uh, low-income populations. Um, we want to be able to expand our niche role here in Uganda in capacity building. We want to be able to support the Ministry of Health in their objectives in clinical care, and we want to improve the likelihood of healthcare workers providing life-saving care. All right, I've got, um, I'll just go through one more slide and then I'll wrap up. So we are a small NGO, uh, but we, and we work alongside giants. Um, even other churches that we're working with that have much larger budgets than we do as a tiny organization and also other faith-based partners like World Vision, Food for the Hungry, Samaritan's Purse, uh, large multi-million dollar organizations that we're working alongside with. 
but we believe that size does not have to limit your impact or your reach. Um, we know that engaging systems at multiple levels has a cumulative effect. And so this is all work that our small team does, engaging at a variety of different levels, top down and bottom up, making sure that we are connecting with people and aligning our agendas and our work all the way from you know, directors at the level of the Ministry of Health, all the way down to village health volunteers um, that, are, that are doing work in their communities. Um, so we know that having impact at all of these different levels, we understand that approaching one question through a holistic approach is essential because we know that a lot of the problems that we address require holistic approaches. The question of why a neonatal death occurs that could have been preventable is a question that needs to be answered at all these different levels. So yeah, so that's where our holistic approach comes in here. And we'll move on to the final slide as well. Um, and I'm gonna wrap up by saying here that, um, yeah, well, you can go ahead and go to the next slide, Kathy, thank you. Um, ultimately, you will look at system strengthening and crisis during the COVID-19 um, pandemic. We recognize that development work becomes ever more critical in times of crisis. And um, we know that the foundational work that we are doing to improve quality of care is something that needs to be done uh, during this time. So yeah, that's my time for my presentation. Any questions on anything that I've shared or more that's covered on COVID-19 as well? Thank you. Thanks so much, Josh. That's uh, fantastic. And, and uh, there are questions that are coming in. Again, we're going to take the questions at the end uh, after each of the presenters has had a chance to speak. Uh, if you have a question, please use the Q&A box uh, for that. So several questions are coming in there. Uh, Josh, very exciting. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to shift now to Perry. Perry Jansen with Africa Mission Healthcare. So Perry, over to you. Great. Uh, thanks again, uh, uh, Doug and the whole CCIH team. You're seeing my slide. Yes, we are. You're seeing my slides? Yep. Okay, great. Well, you know, I think this COVID epidemic really highlights the need for health system strengthening. So the timing is really very good, even though often we are distracted from the long-term planning with short-term planning for COVID. Um, certainly in the U.S., uh, and Europe, uh, where the current epicenter is, um, really people are distracted about their own needs for their own countries. But I think as we look back at the COVID epidemic, um, it's very possible that the greatest health suffering impact and economic devastation may actually be happening, may actually end up happening in the low income countries of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. It's really unclear what the national, what our, our governmental uh, commitment is and the commitment of other donors to really preparing these countries for responding appropriately and recovering from uh, the COVID epidemic. I was on a call a couple of weeks ago with some high level people at USAID that gave me some, some hope that they're at least beginning to recognize the need to begin preparing these countries to respond to the COVID epidemic. Uh, they outlined their, their uh, approach as three phases. The first phase really being the response phase where they're coming in with, with PPE and training and oxygen and support for treatment. Um, switch to, I'm just gonna switch to presentation mode, sorry about that. Uh, that, and then the second phase really to help these places recover from the economic and, and human resource impact of the epidemic. What I was most encouraged by was to hear their, at least their initial commitment and understanding of the importance of building and increasing resilience within health systems. That rather than investing in sort of a silo funding focused on certain diseases or certain outcomes, there's a recognition that it's going to be important to have a greater attention and investment in developing health systems and strengthening partners. And we know at least in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and really throughout Asia and other places that the faith-based uh, sector really plays a huge role within the general health sector. And I think we're gonna be called upon to respond 
to the COVID epidemic if we haven't already. Uh, what we do know, even from watching the news here in the US, that the COVID epidemic is very complex. It involves a lot of political, economic, social, uh, and as well as biological um, uh, mechanisms that we don't fully understand. And what's clear to me is really sort of our usual linear way of thinking when we're thinking about uh, health programs and, and, and aid, where we're moving from input to activities, output, outcomes, impact, is really not gonna be sufficient, that we really need to understand the complexity of diseases like COVID. Here's a, an article from The Lancet showing a, a causal loop diagram of how all the various things of testing and public perception and uh, transmission all impact one another. Um, and, and really highlighting the importance of using systems thinking to look at health problems. And, it, and if you think this is complex, if you map out really the whole interplay of health systems, it's even more complicated. I'm not gonna go into uh, systems thinking and complex adaptive systems too much, but systems thinking is really recognizing that, that uh, systems operate in a way that is much greater than their specific elements. That it's, it, systems involve elements as well as interactions. And ideally, especially in health systems, you're wanting to direct those towards a specific purpose. One really beautiful example of complex adaptive systems is what some people would call murmuration. That's, a, that's the flight of these enormous flocks of starlings. I wish you could see this live in a, in a video, but it didn't quite work with the technology, but where thousands of starlings will move seemingly as one unit forming these beautiful, beautiful shapes that are constantly changing. And they've studied this actually and recognize that there's some very simple rules that these birds are following. One is that they just sort of follow what's in, who's in front of them and who's behind them. They also use light and dark patterns to maintain a right, the appropriate density. And there's flexibility within the systems for birds to go their own way, to make an error and leave the group, or sometimes to even lead the group. Unfortunately, complexity, especially in human systems, isn't always quite as beautiful and sometimes can be very destructive. We've seen actually that some, this is, a, this is the, one of Nairobi's slums that had a riot last week that was started over food distribution that was uh, uh, in response to the COVID epidemic, but has a history uh, of, of social and political and, and economic factors that all brought these people in together and created this situation. Um, complexity theory though, doesn't always have to be chaos. I think we can start using some complex adaptive thinking to be able to recognize patterns and leverage points we're actually trying to help to improve health systems. This is a really interesting study that was done by Jeffrey Braithwaite and, and uh, a group looking at some uh, successful health interventions from across 60 countries to see if there are some common uh, kind of meta narratives, some common themes and leverage points that uh, um, really helped potentially help these programs be successful. I won't go in de into depth, but I, I, I just wanna cover them briefly. One is the acorn to oak tree, meaning that most programs start out very small with local solutions and then gradually grow and building upon success. That also means there are many programs that started small and failed and didn't continue. Uh, and so the successful programs always start small and then gradually build. The second one, data to intelligence. And that's, it, it, it shows that people who can use data, not just to say, well, how many patients did we see or how many procedures, but they can use data to help increase their understanding of the situation and, and allow their teams to actually learn from the data and respond to the data and then grow. The third, the mini hands principle, basically just talking about collaborations, especially across sectors and between organizations. The last one is the, the patient as the preeminent player 
in the system. And that really gets down to the purpose of the system. The purpose isn't just to grow an NGO or just to have the best hospital, but to really recognize that your responsibility is in serving the patient and their needs. Uh, those of us that work in the health sector within, within faith-based organizations recognize that we have our own kind of complexity that we work within. And ideally, as faith-based organizations, we should be working towards similar goals, uh, but often we're not communicating with one another and recognizing opportunities for collaboration. And sometimes we're even working against one another, <laughs> pulling in different directions. And so really this whole, the faith-based health sector is in itself a complex adaptive system that's always changing and always interacting. African Mission Healthcare, the organization that I work with, is really focused on developing improve, uh, enduring and improving health systems. Our mission is health systems where everyone has access to quality, compassionate healthcare. And we're doing that through really one of the key players within the faith-based sector and within health systems in Africa and Asia and, and, and other places, and that is the mission hospital. If we translate this enduring health systems with quality and equity, um, we really translate that to enduring meaning sustainable, something that can keep going and keep growing <clears throat> and maintain its mission. Equity meaning, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on universal access to healthcare. Really, I would say Christian faith-based organizations have really been leading the, the way in this for, for centuries, really, in, in serving the poor and caring for the poor and assuring that the rural poor have access to care. And then the last one being quality. Um, often these actually work against one another. If we think about programs that might increase equity, meaning trying to get the services out there to the poorest of the poor, um, if you don't have lots of resources, usually you, you, you have programs that may actually have very low quality if you don't have enough resources. If you can find resources, then sometimes it creates less sustainability. If we look at aid, which is kind of our usual response to these, these uh, epidemics I mean, and, and these challenges, aid can come in with resources that can provide extra staff and extra money to improve equity and even maintain quality. But as soon as that funding goes away, usually the programs collapse because they haven't invested in sustainability. Some mission hospitals have put in private services where they offer a special care and shorter waits and higher levels of services for those who can pay for care. And that then helps to subsidize care for the poor and, in, and keep the quality high. But all too often they get drawn away towards really seeking after sustainability and, and making the hospital more profitable. And, and it, there's a very high risk that equity will be lost. At least the quality of care for the poor will be lost. And sometimes really at all, the heart for the care for the poor can be lost. Using sort of uh, uh, complex or using systems thinking, um, AMH really has identified several leverage points that we feel are interventions that we can do that will have positive uh, effects on each of these outcomes that we're looking for. Um, these basically are infrastructure strengthening, management strengthening, identifying contextualized funding models, not, not, not all models work in every setting, and emphasizing medical education. And these, I won't go into all of how these affect one another, but ideally these all have a synergistic effect to improve quality, equity, and sustainability in these hospitals. So that is where really AMH invests, is really strengthening infrastructure, management, funding models, and medical education with a number of programs. We've, uh, over the last eight years, um, given about $26 million to, to hospitals and other partners in 47 facilities in 18 countries to help strengthen uh, these institutions to give care for the poor. The, the, organization, the institutions that are receiving the most help are ones that we've identified as potential teaching hospitals that will not only teach and train, 
but will also become themselves what we would call a learning institutions. And I, we're developing now one tool called a maturity matrix that is kind of like a, it's a quiz that people take, that, that an organization takes to show how they're doing in these various domains of management and infrastructure and training, not as an evaluation, but as a learning tool. Uh, at this point, it's, it was formed from some validated uh, questions and, and some subject matter input, including some people on this call. And we're preparing to test this in the field so that it becomes a tool that these organizations can use to identify their gaps, link them to resources to improve in these areas, and then expand their impact. AMH's 30 by 30 commitment is really uh, following what we've been doing all along is strengthening hospital infrastructure, improving hospital management, contextualizing financial uh, models and facilitating medical education. So we're happy to be a part of what AMH, of what uh, CCIH is doing. And we appreciate all that all the partners that are listening are also doing in this. And we look forward to collaboration. Wow, Perry, thank you so much uh, for that, and um, uh, also for some of the backdrop on on the USAID context around around COVID, uh, and and what you're doing with Africa Mission Healthcare. Uh, I, that's fantastic. We'll get to questions in a few minutes. Nancy, uh, we're going to turn it over to you for the next bit. Thank you, Nancy Tenbrook with World Renew. Thank you very much. And if you can get the slides up, Kathy. Thanks so much, Doug and CCH team. I really appreciate being with you this morning and I've learned a lot from the presentations already and I'm trying to jot some questions down for them. So it's an honor to present to you now on behalf of all my World Renew colleagues and I will be sharing about an initiative that we have in World Renew across several countries, which is more a community-based approach. So I have a very short agenda that hopefully I can stay within the time frame on. Next slide, Kathy. I'll overview the World Renew MNCH programs, do interventions, approaches, and strategies that we are doing across these countries, and then give a little bit of evidence of successful cross-cutting strategies and local health systems linkage. A little bit about World Renew. We're an agency of the Christian Reformed Church in North America, and we are based in Canada and the US. We work in about 20 countries worldwide in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and of course, some domestic programming as well, um, more on the relief side. Um, our mission uh, talks about being compelled by God's deep passion for mercy and justice. So we join communities around the world to work on changing their story from poverty to restoring creation, from injustice to reconciling relationships or shalom, and from disaster to renewing hope. We in World Renew um, work on capacity building through local partner organizations. Um, in many cases, these are church-based organizations or uh, local uh, Christian faith-based organizations. So we have always worked in community. You can go back to the last slide, Kathy. Uh, we have worked through um, local partner organizations in community development type programming, agriculture, health, um, literacy, um, income generation, but we realized in 2014, 15, that we weren't doing enough or we didn't have enough capacity and skill, both us and our partners in health programming. We were working in a couple of countries in large grants, that would be Bangladesh, Nigeria, uh, Senegal and Malawi, but in other countries where there was high need and local communities were expressing need, we just didn't have enough uh, capacity either at, on our staff side or with our partners. So we engaged a um, external consultant who is on this call now who really helped work with us and do an extensive evaluation to look at what we could do more in health and how we could help partners more. So we looked at the thousand day programming uh, in a select number of countries, which I will share about. And then these countries of focus were countries that have high death rates for mothers, newborns and children from preventable and treatable conditions and unacceptable levels of child stunting. Next slide. So our objectives, um, we really wanted to promote learning and innovation in health by strengthening World Renews, worldwide maternal, newborn and child health uh, programs um, and also that of our partners. And we wanted to increase the demand for and access to services. We work in communities. Are people aware 
of, of health issues and needs and where to go and when they need to go. So we looked at eight countries with high levels of stunting and we are phasing an approach. So we're still in this process. So we started with Bangladesh where we had some experience and then we moved to Niger, Nigeria, Guatemala and Mozambique and then added later in Kenya, Malawi and Uganda. So we're looking at bringing low cost interventions um, into the home level at the community level and linking them to local health facilities, either the, the government or other facilities that are in the area to help ensure adequate growth of children and good health of mothers and children. Next slide, please. So this is actually based just on one country, just a few things that we're working on so that you can see it's embedded in um, counseling visits by health volunteers, really looking at some of the basic, basic health things related to um, stunting and child growth and mother um, and newborn health. So we're looking in child survival and also then in nutrition in the first thousand days of life. Next slide. So our interventions, we decided to look very simply at interventions in the first thousand days of life, which is a really critical window of opportunity in the communities where we work. And we looked at three specific areas, the appropriate nutrition for the infant and young child, preventing diarrhea, malaria, and pneumonia through basic actions, and then care-seeking behavior for deliveries, for when there are problems with health, when people are sick, and so forth. So those are the three basic areas that we wanted to roll out with our partner organizations in communities in these countries. Next slide. So we looked at a phase and approach and World Renew and our partners were at different levels in different countries. So we basically put them in levels of basic, basic plus and comprehensive. And then under those three areas that I just mentioned, we looked at the needs and what, would, what are important interventions that could be done at those levels. So Bangladesh is the country that started first where we had had a lot of experience in uh, large grants, government grants. And we wanted this to be a learning lab for the other countries and also looking at um, things like positive deviance, HARF, um, behavior change communication, other types of tools that we could then learn and share to the other countries. Then we, we started as well right after that in what we would call basic countries where World Renew did not have a lot of experience in health, nor did our partners, but there were high need. And then we moved most recently to countries where we had experience, we had partners that had experience, um, but maybe hadn't managed large grants yet. And so then we looked at a set package of interventions for them. Um, all of this was looked at, of course, with really looking at robust surveys. Uh, like was mentioned before, uh, with LifeNet, we are also a small organization, but we work among giants. So in the countries, identifying groups that can help us. For example, in Bangladesh, we use LAM Hospital for a lot of our surveys where we can get robust information, share with the communities, make it participatory, and then develop the, the, the interventions with them. So next slide. So the strategies, um, and I give an example here from Bangladesh, that's where I'm based, even though I work with all eight of the countries, um, we really want to see that community engagement. We've been working in most of these communities, there are systems set up, the people's institution is very much like a care group model, it adds a little bit more governance to it, and these have been running in communities, looking at other interventions like agriculture and income generation. And it provides that critical link between households and local health services. We really wanted it to be a voice for the poorest in the community. And many of these people's institutions have been running for 10, 20 years. So that's been a, a really good thing. Um, we also, in all countries, have looked at household level counseling, involving local volunteers and doing timed and targeted counseling. So where the person is at at that time, if it's breastfeeding time, that's what the message is, instead of just the routine kind of general message to everybody at once. Looking at growth monitoring, involving the community, mass media convents, and then other sector areas that will help maternal child health and nutrition. So again, it depends on the country, it depends on the survey result, but looking at these strategies. As well, we had cross-cutting strategies, Again, World Renew is about capacity building and then engagement with local health systems and stakeholders. 
Um, this, of course, right now with, with COVID is really coming out where our community health volunteers in many of the countries are helping the government to ensure that people are following the practices that the government is, is encouraging, um, doing the one-on-ones -on -ones where possible in communities, ensuring that MNCH and nutrition is still taking place and ensuring the hygiene um, and sanitation messages as well. So we really wanted everything, as I said, to be rooted in formative research and involved and engage, engage that local, um, you can go to the next slide, the local uh, um, communities. So Kathy, if you could go back one slide, please. Yes. So we really wanted to build the capacity of field teams and rooted it in networking. So again, they're not alone, but they're linking with who is in that area. If it's a government system, churches that are doing um, health-based centers and so forth, so that they will use that and, and mobilize the community. We find in many of the countries where we work, care seeking isn't there. They don't know what's there. There are barriers to attending clinics. So helping the community work on those, again, embedded in a volunteer system, and then a more uh, robust system of either care groups, people's institution, or whatever contextualized uh, way works in that country. And then also looking at behavior change communication and using that to find barriers and ensure that people are getting the health services they need. Next. Next slide. Advocacy is very important. And again, I just gave an example from Bangladesh where we are finding communities starting to hold government and health officials accountable for quality services, for ensuring supplies and engaging in it, being involved in immunization campaigns, being involved in sanitation campaigns, helping now with COVID to ensure the messaging and ensuring people are following that and aware of symptoms. And then helping to shape local health policies and practices and, and for their needs. So they work closely and link and are involved in government health systems. Next slide. This just shows an example again from Bangladesh and we also have this contextualized in other countries where it is not a parallel system but where the local partner and then the local communities feed into government systems. We have found this over the years working well in Bangladesh where people's institutions are actually part of um, family welfare centers, the government health clinics and involved in these clinic committees so they can advocate for their own communities, the poor and the most vulnerable about what services they need and how to get more services to the poor. Uh, go ahead. So we have found CHVs very useful and in World Renew, really working with these CHVs on what their role is and how they can be, you know, using parables um, to help them see their role of helping and serving their neighbors. And they can accompany people to clinics. We often find in many countries, people don't want to go. So helping people get to clinics, um, helping people have a, rep, a better relationship with them and helping solve issues at the community level. Next. Here are just a few examples where we have connections to local government health systems in some of the different countries. In Kenya and Uganda, um, they very much work with the local government in Kenya at the county level using their materials, using CHVs that are part of the system. In different countries, we use protocols and guidelines and education materials that are either from the government or from other groups where it is approved by the government and then aligning with guidelines, including the MOH workers at district and county level, um, being involved in all the community assessment meetings, the government meetings on health to ensure that the voice of the, the people in these poor communities are being heard. This is something we're still working on and still trying to work more on this as many of the countries were just beginning to roll up. Okay, next. We are very happy as World Renew to be part of this 30 by 30 commitment, uh, working with our partners in these countries. Um, as long-term members of, of uh, CCIH, we really hope to continue working on adaptation and continuation of our MNCH programs and keep modifying them according to our survey results and what's needed in, uh, to be able to contextualize in each country. We want to disseminate learning to other programs in other countries where we work uh, we hope to expand in the countries where we are and then add a couple of additional countries. And we are in that process now, as well as adding interventions related to COVID. 
So thank you very much. That's my presentation. And um, if you do have questions, feel free to contact us. Uh, thank you very much. Nancy, thank you so much for that and, and walking us through that. And, and um, uh, I think everybody can see that when we talk about community, when we talk about health systems, we don't just talk about health facilities. We also want to talk about uh, communities and community engagement because a true, full, robust health system in, includes both. And sometimes, uh, sometimes people will tend to emphasize one or the other. So I'm very happy to see presentations here that, uh, that reflect all of, uh, all of that. Uh, there are a number of questions that are coming into the Q&A box. Uh, I am, uh, we are taking a look at those and, and uh, uh, some of them are easy ones that uh, uh, presenters have already been able to, uh, to answer on, uh, in a few cases. But I want to um, put it back to, uh, to the panel. There's a few of these questions that are, that are really great. Um, if you have other questions, please put them in into the Q&A box, not the chat box. Uh, Josh, going back to the start, I uh, uh, really appreciated uh, all of the talk about the work in, in strengthening the health facilities. There were a couple of questions about how you engage the church. Uh, are there also ways that you see uh, that, that faith-based health facilities might strengthen or empower the local church? There are a few questions on that, and, and I want to give Perry and Nancy also a chance to comment on the same question. So how are you partnering with the church, and what do you think about the spiritual dimension of that work? Um, so, yeah, that's a great question. I think for a lot of us, it's really, really important to discern whether or not the church is separate from the facility or how the facility might be separate from the church. And sometimes the, the question is they are, they are the same entity. Um, you know, I mentioned in one of my slides, working at the various levels of engagement, um, another layer of that when we were talking about The designator is typically a reverend, a pastor, or a sister. Um, our, my, our work also has us interacting with bishops um, and a variety of different clergy. Um, this also involves, you know, at a facility level, interacting with the parish church that is somehow connected to or responsible for that facility. And so throughout all of this, we're engaging with faith leaders. And these faith leaders are representing these congregations that are representing these churches. And the facilities are also a representation and extension of those facilities. Uh, the, the facilities are an extension of the church in that community. And so by coming alongside the church and their identified mission, this isn't a mission that LifeNet puts on them. This is a mission that they hold where they understand that part of their calling, of their representation of who Christ is into that community is the provision of health care. And so then for us, we want to come alongside and make sure that that expression is, an, is one of excellence. And we believe that that is something that Jesus calls us to. So it's kind of, you know, this might be an easy answer, and I'd love to hear the other panelists share. Or this might be a cop-out, but simply by doing what we're doing, we're actively engaging the church because we recognize that these things go hand in hand with one another. But again, that doesn't take into account all the work and engagement that's done in ensuring, particularly clergy, like with our non-communicable disease program, a lot of this is about generating awareness, um, generate sensitizing people to these issues and engaging you know, with, with significant faith leaders, people that have massive followings and ensuring that they are aware of and engaging on these messages the same way that you are, that we want to, the, that we want to do that together. It means that we're multiplying impact. So, yeah, that's kind of my response to that question. Thanks. I want to toss it back to uh, Perry and Nancy. Also, any further thoughts about working with the church and empowering the church through, uh, through your mechanisms? Perry first? Yeah, well, certainly I, for the vast, the vast majority of uh, facilities, I, I would say the church really recognizes that as a key part of their ministry. There are some places where the church and the church leadership is the biggest problem <laughs> to having essential uh, health services go well. And so it is important to have that, that overlap and to have the church have a good understanding of the biblical responsibility of the church to care for the poor. Um, one, one interesting example from the, the Ebola epidemic is that as we, as we look at the turnaround in the public 
uh, re um, response to the Ebola epidemic with, with regard to burial practices and fear and attacks really was that the, the, the population does not see the WHO and the government and other international organizations as trustworthy sources of information, but they do see faith leaders. Mm -hmm. And it was when the faith leaders really started getting good information and started communicating it and the public was hearing it not from the WHO or the guys in the white suits, but from their pastor, then they started believing it. And so having a closer uh, connection um, with faith leaders and recognizing them as a key part of the health system communication to the public is, is I think, really important. And I, I think something that all of our organizations need to, to pay more attention to even than we do. Great. Thanks. Nancy, any further reflections? Right. I would agree with all of that. And I think particularly looking at our countries in Africa, where we work with church-based organizations and with uh, church facilities, that's important. I just wanted to add one thing about in non-Christian contexts, um, where many of our countries are, it's so equally important that the church being small and minority is there and they see it as their um, their responsibility and, and look at um, you know, the biblical mandates in that and how they then can serve their neighbors and how they can help. So I think that's very, very important and help help the church to see that as important, especially where they're in non-Christian contexts and often quite fearful. Mm, wonderful. There are several questions that have come in related to COVID-19, uh, uh, including from uh, people watching on our YouTube channel and, uh, and then here as well. Uh, one, one of the questions referred to COVID-19 as a wake-up call. Uh, another one said that uh, throughout many places in Africa, uh, COVID-19 is not seen as an African problem, it's seen as a, as a problem for other parts of the world. How do we use this moment to help structure or what mechanisms can we put in place to help these faith-based facilities and programs with which you work to be better prepared when, when disasters or emergencies like this come along? Any, any thoughts on that? We only have a couple of minutes, so just please a few brief remarks. And let's go, uh, let's go in reverse order, Nancy, Perry, back to Josh. So any mechanisms or thoughts of what you would put in place around uh, COVID-19, but also just to be ready for disasters or emergencies? Right, I think I'll let the other two speak closer to that since they're more facility based, but I think, yes, I think we have to be ready. I know in countries where we are helping people, you know, being able having the messages out there and the messages clear and that it affects them, especially down in the community levels, at the distant community levels where um, people may not be aware, they see it as a foreign thing, they don't have access to TV and other things, it's what they hear to, to dispel the myths. Great. You know, many of our, our faith-based institutions are located in rural areas that are far away from capital cities where a lot of the decisions are being made by international organizations and government. But as much as possible, I think, for the organizations to uh, build uh, close relationships with, their, with the government uh, um, organizations, with their local Christian health organization, and with uh, um, potential uh, international organizations like the UN. It's good to have those relationships so that they know that you're someone that they can call upon. It's challenging when you live sometimes nine hours drive away from the capital city. Uh, but I think especially focusing on uh, just not operating as, as independent entities, mm -hmm. uh, being interconnected. And I think most importantly with the Christian Health Association in your country, right. be a part of that, add to it, learn from it, have close relationships. Great. Josh? Yeah, thank you. I mean, yeah, just echoing on what Perry says, relationships magnify impact and mm -hmm. Again, we are a small organization, but because we are connected at a variety of levels, it means that we, we can, yeah, you feel bigger than you actually truly are, which is uh, uh, um, sometimes a, a good place to be, especially when you're trying to maximize impact. I'd say those principles of partnership, capacity building and holistic engagement enable a smooth transition from development work, which we're used to, to relief work, which is now kind of coming up with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, so I think on that level, development work and system strengthening is even more critical during these moments. We recognize that this is unprecedented, 
Um, but that's been my biggest kind of lesson learned from particularly being here in Uganda while all of this is unfolding is how close we actually are to making a difference when it comes to relief work because we have a strong foundation that rests on the, the clinical care work that we do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're close to our partners, so we understand what their needs are during this time, specifically in terms of supply chain management and support with like sanitation and hygiene needs. And we're also very effectively able to engage with all partners at the government, partners at the diocese to ensure that we're among first responders to the pandemic here. Um, so again, we're a much smaller organization than a lot of other INGOs that operate here, but we're already a part of the ministry's COVID-19 uh, emergency response team. And so we get to assist in responding to that crisis, as well as being recognized as a role player and just maintaining quality of care services for essential medical services that have to carry on right. during pandemic and during lockdown. That's essential. That's fantastic, and and that's some that's some rich uh, fodder for future webinars and discussions, and and uh, uh, for joint uh, relationship development and strategies. Thank you all. We've run out of time. There are many more questions that are coming in. We're going to look at those and see how we can answer some of those uh, back to the back to the people that uh, originated them. Uh, uh, I want to really thank Josh, Perry, and Nancy for taking the time to be with us. Uh, today, this was uh, truly uh, enlightening and, and fascinating for me. Um, please let us know what you thought about this webinar. You can get on to that. Uh, the, the link was shared in the chat box. Uh, so you can visit tinyurl.com slash 30x30feedback, and you'll see it there. Uh, we will also make this available on, on uh, live recorded on YouTube, uh, so you can uh, you can watch it and see all the presentations uh, through that. And if you were registered for this, you'll get that in your email as well. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Let me pray for all of us uh, as, we, as we wrap up today. Let's pray. Uh, dear God, we thank you for this. We thank you for this event and all of the, the people that have participated and for the panelists uh, who you have equipped to do such amazing work. Please. Uh, give us courage and <clears throat> wisdom as we continue on with all of this as we move forward. And thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, everybody, thanks so much for being part of this webinar. And uh, I guess that's it. Thanks so much. <laughs>